Hi, this is Larry Benko, W0QE, and this video is about interesting RF circuits. Over time, I keep finding myself using a small group of circuits over and over and over again for a lot of different purposes. And the picture in the video is one of those circuits. The picture in the video is a fairly simple circuit. It's, it's a dual capacitor, uh, one shaft, two rotors, independent stators, and a fairly large uh, current inductor attached to a small piece, uh, a six inch piece of RG142. Um, and this circuit has a lot of different uses. Uh, it's useful enough that I have three different ones for three different frequencies. So let's continue on in, with SimSmith here and, and see uh, why a circuit like this might be useful and how SimSmith can help us understand what the usefulness of some of these things and, and perhaps along the way, um, I don't know, have some fun. Here's the circuit that was just in the previous picture. It is a, it's two capacitors. They both have the same value. C1 is the value. Even one capacitor is called C1, one's called C2, but they both have value C1. C1 is a parameter that we can change. There's, inductor, there's an inductor across one of the capacitors and this circuit does not connect any further downstream at all. Uh, it's, it just terminates in itself here. What we have here is we have a circuit that as we, if we pick the appropriate value for the inductor up here and we, and we vary the capacitor, we can come up with all the different phase angles for a given SWR with some small approximations as we can see in the circuit here. And the small approximations are due to the, the typically unfortunate fact that inductors are not very ideal components. We change the inductor value to a Q of 3000, we see it matches very, very nicely. Now there's some things we can do about that, but let's keep on with a, a more reasonable inductor. So what I've got here is I've got a 3 dB attenuator. Of, well, let's start at the beginning. I've got a transmitter here that is a 100 watt transmitter what the power is in parameter a and parameter a is set to be 100 it's a 100 watt transmitter it's a uz0 type so any impedance other than exactly 50 ohms will have a reduction in power here i have a 3 db attenuator and i have this circuit a 3 db attenuator gives me a 6 db return loss a 6 db return loss so a 6 db return loss here is basically a 3.01 SWR. And we see something like that around here. Over here, we see a reduction in the SWR due to the fact that the inductor isn't, uh, as I said before, isn't perfect. But what we got here is, is a circuit now that's capable at 14.1 megahertz with a 600 nano Henry inductor, which is what the picture was, showed, and a capacitor that varies between, let me close this window, varies between 25 and 250 picofarads. Now the capacitor in the picture, let me bring the picture back up again real quickly here. The capacitor in the picture was a dual 25 to 335 picofarad capacitor with 0.06 inch spacing on the plates. So it was good for about 2,500 volt peak. And these are, I don't know what this capacitor is originally used for, but I find them in Hamfest fairly often. I've got about a dozen of them. This one I just cleaned up um, with, you know, a, bl uh, I don't know, a little smell, some alcohol and a little bit of work. And it's got really good wipers, multiple big, big flat wipers on both, both sides, high current. And it works very, very nicely for this type of a purpose. So, um, I mean, this is about a 620 nano Henry inductor. When you wind inductors out of quarter inch copper pipe, you find that you don't have uh, super fine control over the inductance value, but it's close enough. So what I've got here now is with this attenuator in there, and this, this attenuator could be a hundred watt attenuator. When you find these things periodically on eBay and stuff, 75 watts will be attenuated into it with a hundred watt transmitter. A uh, 100 watt 3 dB attenuator, I can test out my transmitter to see how it operates with all different phase angles of a 3 to 1 SWR. And we can see that as we will are willing to change this to, change it to path, and I'm just going to vary my inductance value. 
or excuse me, my capacitance value. Now we see you see more action down here for a 10 picofarad change than you do at the at the end, so it's not linear. But it's a fairly smooth transition. So as we go between, uh, we can go up to 335, but it's, there's no reason to continue on. At 330 here, we, once we get an overlap, there's no reason to, to have to go any further. But as we would turn the knob, we would basically pro do this progression. And um, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a nice circuit to have. So you could put it on the output of your 100 watt transmitter, and you could see that the transmitter could, what power it would produce into the 3 to 1 SWR if you cared to. We could also ramp this up. And <clears throat> when I say ramp it up, uh, let's change this to a, th to a 1500 watt load. Now, 1500 watt load means we need a 1000 watt 3 dB attenuator here, but let's ignore that issue for a minute. This could be used on the output of a solid state amp to prove that it can transmit into 3 to 1 SWR. It could be used on the output of a solid state amp to prove that the output filters could tolerate a 3 to 1 SWR and not blow up. It could be used for lots of different purposes along these same kind of lines, though. Let's see if we can make this circuit a little bit easier to come by. This uh, 1000 watt 3 dB attenuator is probably not in, in most people's uh, junk boxes. I am capable of building this exact same circuit again with two resistors instead of instead of three uh, three that would be in, attenu in an attenuator. I can start with the resistor that represents the SWR I want on the high side. So 150 ohms is a 3 to 1 SWR. And we get our 3 to 1 SWR right there. Now, we have a problem on the low end the circuit becomes too low of an impedance. We need a we need a, a series resistor that represents a resistance value such that when the lowest impedance this can be in series with this, when it's in parallel with this, gives us the low side of a 3 to 1 SWR. The low side of a 3 to 1 SWR is 50 divided by 3, which is 16.666. So if this goes to exactly 0 ohms at some point in time, this would be 18.75 ohms. Well, as we can see, that this doesn't happen. So, because this never really goes to zero due to the unfortunate fact that the inductor has Q. It does represent a circuit that's pretty good on the high impedance side. So, in the low impedance side, what we need to have happen is this circuit right here, if it's below the resonance, the below the parallel resonant point, it will look inductive. When the inductive reactance of this circuit, not the inductor, but the circuit, matches the inductive reactance of the capacitor, that's the lowest impedance it can be. On the other hand, if we get to the parallel resonant point of this circuit, it doesn't matter what C1 is up here, we, it's an open. And when it's an open, the Q of, of L1 doesn't really matter too much. But once it's short, it matters a lot. So that's why we're seeing the reduction in SWR here. Now, if we decided that we could come up with these components, well, we could probably come up with this component too. So if we change the 18 ohm resistor down a little bit, you'll notice that this, this matches now 3 to 1 SWR quite a bit more. However, it means I need a 560, well, it doesn't mean I need these powers at all. Uh, as I vary these, as I vary this, you'll see the powers change. If I, cha if I change it enough here, I get this being over 1,000 watts. And as I change it enough the other direction, we see this be above 900 watts. So these are big, these are big resistors, not very easy to come by either. But this is another way this circuit would work at a low power, at a low power level. The other alternative we've got at this circuit is to put a piece of transmission line in there. Now, if I put large transmission line in there, such as, say, um, RG213, I will find out that I need quite a bit of it. Maybe you've got a lot of, uh, you've got a couple hundred foot spools floating around here. Let's increase the length of the transmission line. We're getting pretty close there. That's 384 feet. That's a lot of transmission line. Maybe too much. Perhaps we could change this to something smaller. In my case, I usually use stuff like RG316. It's small coax. It's fairly lossy, but it's Teflon, and you can and you can run it at some pretty high temperatures. The other thing is you can throw it in a bucket of water too. So let's um, make the link smaller. Now it doesn't give me as good a match because it's. Uh, 
well, it doesn't give a good, as good a match because the difference between the loss at the high current and low current um, parts of the transmission line are larger. Um, so, but we can compensate for that if we if we really care to. We can drag this down a little bit more. I don't know. I don't know something like this, say, and we put a resistor here. I don't know what value here. Just bear with me for a moment here. We'll get this close. That's not too bad. And if you really want to be particular about it, that's pretty good. This is some of the wonderful stuff that you can do in SimSmith. And, and very quickly you learn how, how you can do it. It's, it's pretty easy to do. This 29 micro, 28 microhenry inductor will not have very much current in it. Even at 1500 watts at this particular setting, it's only got, well, it's got way less than an amp in it, so it's no problem. This resistor will have some power in it as we sweep the as we sweep the capacitance, um, and maybe maybe you don't maybe it's too much power. It's 60 watts. Uh, it's certainly not 1,000 watts. But independent of that, even if, even if we go the route where we don't use anything, this is not a terrible um, representation of a three to one SWR. Let's see. It's a little bit higher than 3 to 1 SWR here. It's a 3.15 to 1 SWR. And over here, it's a 2.85 to 1 SWR. That's not too bad. So we could use this circuit at, a th at 1,500 watts on the output of an amplifier to, to do some tests. And I've done that uh, for some customers who've c come to me and asked me to uh, uh, verify some stuff for them. And this works out extremely nicely. Now, if we were to take this component out of the circuit completely. We see this large circle. Large circle is very high SWR. It's again our, our same phase rotator that we, that we had at the beginning. However, we don't have any loss in here, or we have the only loss we have in here is due to the inductor. If we look at this, we see SWRs down here in the order of oh, 1,000 to 1 SWR, 500 to 1 SWR. But over here, the lowest SWRs we see are 67, 67, 69, 67. Now, if you think about that, 67 to 1. Coincidentally, the LD MOS transistors are all rated to work at 65 to 1 SWR and be okay. Where do you think the 65 to 1 SWR came from? Well, it comes from the fact that this circuit right here is, in my opinion, exactly what you see in that little box on all the YouTube videos where they show the LD MOS transistors and the guy uh, spinning the dial and um, saying it's going through all the phase angles. And sometimes I'll show you a, a network analyzer plot to show, that, to show that it is going through all the phase angles. A 65 to 1 SWR, bring this over here. Put a 65 to 1 SWR here. That's a 9, 0.97 reflection coefficient. That means that 97% of the voltage that goes out on the line comes back at some phase angle. 97%. Do you think for a second that, that the transistor can take that and can't take 100% of the voltage coming back? The, the reason they spec it at 65 to 1 is because that's all their circuit will do. So this little box that they've got that looks like this probably has exactly the same circuit that I've got in mind. My, my circuit is small enough to fit in the box that, that they generally show that plugs right into the back end of their amplifier. Uh, a lot of times the, the box is on some kind of sliders. It slides over the guy um, just... Uh, makes the connection and he shows how this works now uh, some usually these these cases they're showing the amplifier not being driven continuous output but being pulsed but it nevertheless it shows it not breaking down uh, due to voltage at those um, at any phase angle and again the 65 to 1 swr i believe comes from the fact that you know physics physics does not work with, uh, better for somebody who has more money so a company like NXP that is capable of buying a better inductor here, a Q of 300 on a 600 nanohenry inductor is probably about the limits. 
Uh, now, they could have done exactly what I did if they had wanted to make this circuit a little bit better. They could have done, they could have put a resistor in parallel with the circuit. Um, it ends up being a very high resistance. That's pretty close, say 5K. And we notice that it's a little bit lower SWR here than here. We could put an inductor again in parallel, scoot that up just a tad. So I don't know where the, I don't know where this leaves us exactly, but if we if we plot this against say a, a 70 to 1 SWR, it's a pretty close match to a 70 to 1 SWR everywhere. I doubt if they put this in the box because this 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 component ends up having to be. Yeah, they could have put it in the box. Who knows? Never, nevertheless, um, that's another way to achieve it. But notice how with conventional components we're stuck at around. If we want to generate all the phase angles, we're stuck at somewhere around 70 to 1 or less. And I believe that's where that spec came from. And the reason I believe that is because I had someone who worked at Motorola in the past when they used to spec the transistors at 30 to 1 all phase angles, told me that the 30 to 1 phase angle was not a limitation of the transistor, but was a limitation of the test device. And the test device was a different circuit. It was a circuit that... looked like this. Two inductors a gain capacitor. This circuit actually will work over a little bit wider frequency range than the circuit I have, but nevertheless it um, it has higher voltages. It is, here's a case where the voltage is um, 1500 volts. We'll go back to their circuit in a minute, but this is what the circuit they used to use. It was a bigger box. Being a bigger box, they, they didn't locate it right at the amplifier. They located it in, in a, um, a bay or something nearby. And the attenuation in the piece of coax that they had, which is not, not this length, of course, um, which is a shorter length, uh, gave them the 30 to 1. So let's go back to our circuit for a minute here. If we were willing to just throw these away again and put a piece of transmission line in there, and, and it can be, uh, at this point in time, say it's RG213, and it's at, set our SWR to be 30 to 1, how much transmission line do I need before I get to 30 to 1? It only needs 20 feet. So 20 feet would be just, you know, the kind of distance you'd have by taking it down and putting this, uh, this box in some kind of a remote location. And he, I was told it had like a motor on it and it would just slowly rotate through the phase angles. That means it also was, apply, was, was giving the amplifier higher than 31 SWR at this phase angle, higher than 31 here, but at least you could say that it, at every phase angle it was at least 30 to 1. So anyways, this circuit is an interesting circuit. It has a lot of uses and it's a lot of fun um, <clears throat> to play with a transceiver. I've taken it and put it on the output of transceivers, see, see if the tuner can um, handle all 3 to 1 SWRs. You can change it quite easily to make it 4 to 1 SWR and you can see that many of the transceivers will handle 4 to 1 SWRs at some impedances, not all of them. Some will handle 4, 4 to 1 SWRs everywhere, but not all bands. The downside of this circuit, of course, is the fact that this circuit needs to be scaled for the frequency. So if I, let me just take this piece of transmission line out again, and let's say I wanted to use this, say, on 80 meters. So on 80 meters, let's say we want to do our test at 3.6 megahertz. We notice we don't have anywhere near a full rotation uh, in phase angle. We either need more capacitance, a larger range of capacitance, or we need larger inductors. So we need larger inductor for sure. So let's make our inductor larger. Let's see, what are we showing here? We're showing the sweep over the range from 25 to 250. Well, I said our capacitor is 335, actually, so let's at least use all, all of it. So if, if we make our inductor 6.5 microhenries, we're capable of getting a full rotation on 80 meters. Now, notice um, we're hurt even more than before by virtue of the fact that the inductance is large and the Q has more resistance. So we don't, our circle isn't uh, quite as even as it used to be. For To get the circuit more even, we would need to do something like change the capacitor here to be maybe say, say a thousand picofarads. We can't get down to 25, maybe let's say it's 45 picofarads to a thousand. 
And now we can drop our inductor value down. There we have full rotation, and it's a little bit more even. But this is not an unreasonable thing. These could be, uh, these are not high voltage, high voltage uh, components at all. Let's take the previous example again here, and let me reload it because I lost it now in the process. Oops, not that one. It's this one. At three to one, um, and let's let's look at the voltages that we that we see in this circuit. In this circuit, I've there's a lot of new stuff now that's gone on here in Sim Smith recently, and this would be a good time to to, to mention it. We used to plot um, with something called well, we still do, we still can. You can do plot the magnitude of U1 C1 V for voltage, and we plot on the, plot on the Y1 axis. There's a new function called RMS. RMS does not have magnitude attached to it anymore, or does not have phase attached to it like like this like this voltage did. Um, and it works with um, multiple frequency applications of Sim Smith and stuff. So I just use it all the time. I use RMS in place of this all the time. So I can look at the voltage of C1, the voltage of C2, the voltage of the current of C1, the current of C2, and I can look at the current in L1. And I can look at that over as I plot the rotation uh, from C1. So the voltage is here. It gets up to maybe 800 volts RMS gets to 800 volts RMS. The currents are uh, maybe 7 amps. That one goes to maybe 8.5 amps. And the inductor current is more. So with 800 volts here, I don't really have that much voltage that I really need that big of a capacitor, uh, that you know, wide of a voltage range. Even if I get rid of these components, now so this is the case where I'm doing the the full the full big one the full big revolu the revolution again of all the phase angles. You will see that the capacitor voltages are 1,200 volts, basically 1,200 volts, RMS. My capacitor that I had in my circuit was rated at 2,500 volts peak. So 1,200 volts RMS is less than 2,500 peak. It's got about a 50. Um, I don't know. 1,200 volts uh, RMS times 1. Point, say 5 is 1,800 volts on a 2,500 volt capacitor, so it won't arc. So this is a, you know, this is a good way to test stuff. Anyways, the circuit may not be for everybody, but it's but it's an interesting use in SimSmith, and it's just one of uh, a group of circuits that that I find um, find interesting. I hope somebody somebody else has find it interesting also. Continuing on with another circuit. This circuit is an interesting circuit. It basically is the same circuit that Drake used in their tuner, the MN2700. It was an interesting circuit because C2 and C3 were variable capacitors. C1 and L1 were fixed components. I'm running this circuit backwards right now, and I'm using it to, to generate, in this case, I'm going to generate all 3 to 1 or less impedances at the transmitter. So the first thing I do, I start at 50 ohms, which is right there. I use my capacitor here, which is 500 picofarads, to move me down to here. I use my inductor, which is 725 nanohenries, to move me up to here. Now, I'm, I'm up here. As long as I'm in the range where I'm above this, above the circle right here, and above the circle right here, this area of the, Sims, of the Smith chart has a very nice characteristic, and that is you can match to 50 ohms with two capacitors. They can be this they can be this orientation or they can be that orientation, it doesn't matter, but I can match it with two capacitors. Now, I have to get up here far enough that the smallest capac... So if I'm going to drag this down to be a 3 to 1 SWR here, I have to make sure that this, capa this arc here is a small enough capacitor, 67 picofarads, that it's, it's, a, it's, well, it's a small enough capacitor. If I tried to get over here any further than, say, like about here, we start to see that this capacitor is down to 20 picofarads now. So that sets where I have to, that sets my point here a little bit. The other way I have to set the point is over on this side. And that says that when my arc has to go down here long enough that I can still get, an, 
my arc here to be at a three to one circle. So if I take this circuit right here and start to play games with it by, by just you know stopping at various places, I see that it has very nice movement. It's not like a T network that has, that's very abrupt and hard to use. It is such that I, I've got a couple of Drake MN 2700s I've picked up over the years. I can set these capacitance values by the dials accurately enough that I can reproduce them very easily. So if I wanted to generate, say, eight different impedances, you know, along around a circle, I could just write the numbers down on a little sticky notepad, leave them on the tuner, and be able to do it on a given frequency. And it works pretty nicely. The beauty of this circuit is instead of instead of covering very wide range of impedances, it doesn't cover that wide of a range of impedances. If we look at the range of impedances it covers, um, let's sweep the capacitance for, on C2, and let's sweep the capacitance on C3, and we'll sweep C2 from, say, about, and I won't, I won't make these extra low values like you get with a vacuum variable, so I'm going to say make them 30 to, say, 300 and 350, which again is what my capacitor that I just had a little while ago had. had. Uh, that capacitor wouldn't be usable, usable because these need to be independently controlled capacitances, but that's okay. It's a, very, it's a reasonable capacitor to find. That's the range of impedances it can, it can match. Now, it's a little tricky seeing this 3 to 1 SWR circle underneath it here, but if I turn this off, you can kind of see where it, where it is. It covers all the 3 to 1 SWRs with, with a little bit of margin. And the only odd uh, things you get are down here. If you get down here, you'll start to see some high voltages on the components. But in this range, the voltages on the components are all very, very nice, nicely behaved. You can build a circuit like this and make these be almost broadcast variable type capacitors you used to find uh, for 100 watt applications. For a 1000 watt application, you probably need these to be a little bit higher. Let's look at the voltages we see. And... Uh, just think about this for a minute. We'll turn off this. We'll turn off the the, um, the sweeping, and let's just move this around to, to to say four different points under and see what the voltages are. So out here, this capacitor sees 604 volts. This one sees 378. Now you're going to notice something. That this one always sees exactly the same voltage no matter what, because for this being 50 ohms fixed fixed capacitor fixed inductor, this is always going to be fixed voltage point right here. So this capacitor is always a 604 volt capacitor. It's not always the same capacitance, and this one does vary. So look at these two values here. So make that a little bit bigger. So it's 604 volts and 378. Here it's 604 and 280. Here it's 604 and 578. And here it's 604 and 848. So the highest voltage it gets is somewhere down here on the second capacitor. Let's move it a little around a little bit more, see if we get more voltage. 859, 832, 839. So somewhere in here, about 860 volts is the biggest it gets. That's not that much. A lot of little broadcast capacitors will handle 500 volts. So two of them in series, um, you know, because you, you don't need a lot of capacitance here. The, the, the most capacitance I needed here was, let's, let's go look at that again. So I need here, I need 92, 290, 180, 90. So here's, the, here's where I need the most capacitance is right up here. So... I don't know you can play games. We could we could increase this we could increase this a little bit here. Uh, then I need a lower capacitance here to be to be here. Yeah, we can play some games. But anyways, this circuit is very interesting. It's, as far as being a tuner, if you want limited range, or if if you want it to to you want to be able to generate a limited number of uh, not a limited a limited range of impedances to some circuit you're trying to test, <clears throat> this circuit has has very nice controllability. And it's very, very easy to uh, make it repeatable, as opposed to a T-network, which has three components, which you can really, is, is very hard to reset by the dials, unless you have very accurate dials. 
And a Pi network just doesn't give you the range you need without the capacitances becoming incredibly large. And uh, anyways, it's a good circuit for that purpose. So that's the second circuit that I keep running into. And since I have a couple MN 2700s, I just turn them around backwards and run them into run them into what I'm trying to test, and it works very very nicely. Hopefully, this circuit has been interesting to some people. And for the third circuit, actually the third and the fourth circuits um, are almost identical. For the third circuit, we're going to decide that we need to actually test our components. SimSmith will tell us what values we need on components. And when I, like previously, I've said, well, we need this much voltage, this much current. Well, how do we know that the component you've got in your hand is good enough? It turns out that there's a lot of new electronics available. And the new electronics um, doesn't have quite the specs some of the old electronics has. And a good example is, of that is a lot of multi-layer ceramic capacitors. A lot of them are built with uh, uh, NPO class one dielectric. And if you aren't aware of it, there is an NPO class two dielectric. NPO means, uh, you know, it's basically flat with temperature, uh, the capacitance, but you can only use the class one dielectric with an RF, uh, in an RF environment. The class two ones are meant to be primarily bypassing those types of capacitance, capacitors. Um, companies like TDK make a line of capacitors, which are, um, let me find a data sheet here real quickly. Okay, TDK makes a line of capacitors. They're size 4520. Now these are metric numbers. So if you're familiar with surface mod parts, these are 18, uh, uh, 1808s. Uh, they make these and they make some that are in 4532 package, which is an 1810. 1810 is a fairly small. It's 18 is, is 0.18 inches from here to here, and it's basically a tenth of an inch this way. Now, some of these parts get to be pretty high. They're a tenth inch high, but uh, they do specify ESR versus frequency. There aren't many companies that do that, which is kind of nice. So if we take this here and we zoom in on it, let's see, that's about as close as I get. This shows some pretty low ESR numbers up to 100 megahertz versus frequency. Matter of fact, ESR is fairly flat. Uh, it's in the, but it's so low here, it's hard to read it on, hard to read it on the scale. But we could, we could draw some conclusions from this. This is 0.1 ohms, this is 0.2 ohms. So it's definitely less than 0.2 ohms. So if it's point, let's say it's, um, let's say it's like 0 0.13, 0 0.14 ohms. So at 0.14 ohms, I squared R has to be less than the package can take. Well, an 18, 1810 package is less than a one watt part, less than a one watt resistor. One watt resistors are generally 2512 type packages. So let's assume this is about to be about 0 0.700, 0 0.800 mil, 800 milliwatts. So we'd, we'd take our current, whatever it would be, it'd be I squared times our resistance here, we're gonna call it say 0.13 ohms is equal to say 0.8 amp, or is equal to 0.8 watts. So I'm doing this as we're I'm talking. So 0.8 divided by 0.13 equals, and take the square root of that, we got basic, We basically have a two and a half amp capacitor at RF. And a two and a half, two and a half amp capacitor is up, you know, from basically DC to 100 megahertz. And that, and that capacitor turns out to be about an 80 cent capacitor from Digikey or Mauser, unless I buy a thousand of them, and that becomes a 20 cent capacitor. So if I had a need to have some friends who wanted some of these, or you know, whatever, um, you know, that's what I, pretty much what I get. Um, 20 cent capacitor is pretty darn cheap. This is a 27 picofarad capacitor. Now, if I go up in capacitance to a higher value capacitor, I'll find that, um, okay, the value of this capacitor is, 100 picofarads, it's got a little bit of higher, a little higher ESR. But again, oh no, it doesn't, it's lower ESR. This is 0.1, this is 0.01. So it's even lower yet. So here we are, let's see if we can zoom in on that. So let's say we're gonna use it up to say 50 megahertz. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. 50 megahertz, it's gonna be 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.04, 0 0.05. So it's 0.05 ohms at 50 megahertz. So again, using the same 0.8 watt number, we'd take 0.8 watts, we'd divide it by 0.05 ohms, 
we take the square root of that and we come up with four amps. So that's a four amp part. Now I measured a bunch of these parts um, basically in a circuit here, that's what I'm getting at. And I measured them in such a way that, um, let me bring up some pictures while we're at it here. I built a tester that is an L network and it's a big giant inductor, 3 8 inch edge wand inductor came out of an AM radio station. Uh, it's a 5,000 volt vacuum variable capacitor, uh, 10 to 10 to 1,000 picofarads. And it's got a terminal block up here with big terminals and various pieces of stuff that I can put up there and I can configure the circuit. And basically it can be configured, um, there it is up close. So here's some of these capacitors being tested. They're tested with some uh, 107 degree centigrade uh, paint that comes from a company called Omega who makes this lacquer that you, you paint, paint this stuff on. It's an RF non-conductive and it melts at a temperature. And it's accurate to within about a degree. And it's much better than a temperature gun, uh, an infrared gun, because a lot of infrared uh, thermometer uh, guns have a problem in operating in a high RF field. If you operate them in a the field uh, while I'm transmitting, you'll find out that they're, um, the numbers are kind of wacky. But this paint is very reliable. Here's three different values in, in series. I just did it in series because I could. Um, but anyways, this, it's very important to be able to, to come up with the values of the parts you actually, um, will actually, parts that will actually last in a circuit. So if we have a circuit here, and let's say I've got a 100 watt transmitter, and I put a capacitor here that I want to measure. I'll put it right there. And I'm going to call it, just for so we, everybody knows what we're talking about, it's a device under test. I'm going to put an L network here to match to 100 ohms, or excuse me, match to 50 ohms again. And as I vary this capacitor, my L network will keep, keep, me, keep me honest here because it's an automatic adjusting L network at the moment. But let's say at 100 picofarads, I can get 1.4 amps through my component. At 160 picofarads, 200, 400, 500 picofarads, it's still 1.4 amps. And it's always 1.4 amps for the very simple reason that 1.4 amps into a 50 ohm load is 100 watts. I had 100 watts, that's all I can do. I can't do any better, I'm stuck. So if I want to measure a component above 100 watts, excuse me, above 1.4 amps, and I only have a 100 watt transmitter, I can't do it with this kind of a circuit. What I can do though, is I can play games. And I can play a game, a game with a circuit by putting a load here to, to decrease the impedance of this circuit a lot and now the, the, the current that flows through my device under test is 4.9 amps. Granted my um, circuit here um, is a different network but I can still match to it. Now it may be it may be wiser not to make this a capacitor. This capacitor has 4.8 amps in it already too. Um, in, in my case a lot of, a lot of these cases I ended up doing this an inductor i made the inductor a small value a small value of inductance anybody can come up with an inductor like this all you do is wind it with some uh, you know wind it with quarter inch uh, um, water line if you want copper water line or uh, wind it with 10 gauge wire it's only 4.8 amps 10 gauge wire is fine for that now i have a low impedance here i need to match it and i'm done now the thing you have to be careful about is that 14 watts of power is lost in my inductor here. So if I don't know the Q of my inductor, it's assumed to be 200 in this case, I will get slightly wrong answers. So sometimes it behooves me to um, take that into account. Actually, it behooves you all the time to take it into account if you want, it accurate, if you want to be accurate. But you're not going to be off on your inductance value a massive amount. So we have 14 watts lost in this circuit with a Q of 200. What if the Q is say 400, we have eight watts, that's only six watts difference. What if the Q went, went down a lot? It goes up a little, it goes up some. It doesn't, let's look at what current flows here. So if the Q is as low as say 120, that's pretty low Q. We still, we have 4.8 amps flowing through here. If the Q goes up to say 400, we have 5.2. So 4.8 to 5.2, that's not that much. That's a that's basically 5 amps plus or minus 0.2. So that's only a 4% change, if I did that math right, um, 
by not taking it taking into account Q. And you can assume some average Q, so you might as well just assume some average Q and keep on going. Again, the purpose of doing this is not to be able to find out exactly what current to perk dies at, or, you know, will die at, but we're how to build it so in such a way that it's um, conservative. And if we go back to the um, the capacitors again, these little capacitors have, as as all capacitors do, they need to be soldered onto a board in a manner where the board is preheated. Otherwise, you're always pulling on the end caps. They call these things multi-layer ceramic capacitors because effectively they're a capacitor on top of a capacitor on top of a capacitor stacked on top. And if you if the board is not is cold when you solder the part on, which is the case when you hand solder them, and you heat these up and you shrink them, you know, they heat up, they, they expand, and the cool board down, it shrinks. There's a lot more stresses on the part. It's better if the board was heated when the part was heated. You're always going to heat the part when you solder it. So you might as well have them one be hot, one be, you know, they both be hot at the same time. But if you don't heat the part up as much, these components become incredibly reliable. They're rated 125 degrees C. I said I was only going to run them at 107. You could reduce that even more. Um, remember in amateur radio, we beat parts in a way that's really bad. And the reason we beat them badly is because we modulate on a very low, on a very long, but yet high duty cycle. Um, a good example would be uh, running RTTY where, you know, 20 seconds on and then 20 seconds off, 20 seconds on, 20 seconds off. The co time constant of these little components is tiny. A few, uh, five or six seconds is probably time constant. So we heat them up, they cool down. They heat up, they cool down. That's a much harder life on a component than um, heating them up once, turning the power supply on and leaving it on for 10 years. So consequently, we'll see failures if we don't derate the parts. And... Again, though, these parts are tiny. You can say, well, I'm going to go use some doorknob capacitor. Well, go good, good luck finding your you know, $20 doorknob capacitor that only has an, a 5 or 6 amp rating. Two of these has a 5 or 6 amp rating also. They're just as reliable, but you have to be a little bit more careful. Anyways, it's another use of SimSmith to be able to, to size components. And for the final example, uh, we basically do the same thing we did, did before. Same circuit, except uh, son of a gun here. Here, let me bring this. Let me bring this one over. We change the circuit instead of being a low impedance circuit. We try to make it a high impedance circuit to test voltage. So we put either a capacitor in here, a small value capacitor, or we put a high value inductor here. So at this point becomes a high voltage point. This high voltage point here now, with a 100 watt transmitter, this point instead of being 70 volts is now 300 volts. Let me make this bigger again. Is 300 volts. At 300 volts here, we get, this is the device under test. It now goes to ground. And we again, we, and again, we tune it. These, the, you can see how we have an L network and we have some other components along here. And that's effectively all I did when I built this, um, when I built this box. It's an L network. I can use it on all bands, although I need to, I need to put different parts in at different places. This is a current tester. This is a voltage tester. This is a 160 meter current tester. Um, these, these wires fit in different places on here and effectively it's like a little patch panel. Um, nothing terribly special about it. It's just, you know, a way to do things, but it lets me build, uh, let me, lets me build stuff that's reliable and have a good feeling when I'm done that I actually know it's reliable as opposed to just guessing at the values, um, you know, guessing at the how, guessing at stuff. I'm sure everybody's seen a, um, oh, a ham fest uh, T tuner that was built, you know, 25 years ago. That's got the guy's got vacuum variable capacitors in it, and he's got a rotary, a roller inductor with 14 gauge wire. Well, there's, uh, you can set that inductor on fire in a, in a, in a T network. At a, at a kilowatt, and those vacuum variable capacitors have 40 amp uh, current ratings. So, you know, it's kind of a, you know, it's it, it's nice to know what you're doing in terms of sizing components. Again, this this kind of a circuit I keep coming back to over and over and over again for doing things. I bring it out, I use it for half an hour, I put it away, and it's a way to be able to, um, you know, one of the things I'm kind of kind of kind of big on is as a community it'd be nice if we can increase our competency and when people build stuff and that means articles for magazines and stuff if somebody actually went through and did some of this due diligence um, 
it would really do, I think it would be good for the community in general. Hope everyone's enjoyed this and uh, thank you for watching.